from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today's lecture is presented by the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. The Kluge Center is a vibrant scholars center on Capitol Hill that brings together scholars and researchers from around the world to stimulate and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. The center offers opportunities for senior scholars, postdoctoral fellows, and PhD candidates to conduct research in the Library of Congress collections, and we also offer free public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs, as well as administer the Kluge Prize, which recognizes lifetime achievement in the study of humanity, and which was recently awarded to philosophers Jürgen Habermas and Charles Taylor. For more information about these and other events, or to learn how to conduct your own research at the Library of Congress, please sign our email list on the way out, or you can visit our website, loc.gov slash Kluge. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the library's European division. The European division enhances the value of the library's vast European collections through the recommendation of collection materials, assistance to scholars, libraries, federal agencies, and the public, and interpretation of the collections through guides, bibliographies, and other studies. Tracing its origins back more than 100 years to 1907 and the creation of the Library of Congress Slavic section, Today, the division includes collections from across nearly all of Europe, only excluding Iberia and Great Britain. And today's lecture is titled, Imminence of Estrangement in Liability of Inner Immigration. Our speaker is Sretan Ugricic, a distinguished visiting scholar in the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Ugricic is a political and intellectual exile from Serbia and a former Yugoslavian national whose research at the library focuses on the tensions between self-censorship and inner immigration under totalitarian regimes. His talk today will focus on the status of art and literature produced in totalitarian regimes, exploring the options available for those artists who don't go to exile, whether they choose to continue their artistic production, to cease it, or to hide it. His research questions whether inner immigration a form of political disassociation and dissidence is just another form of self-censorship or whether it is possible to claim inner immigration with credibility and integrity. Ugricic is the author of 10 books covering multiple genres, including novels, short stories, essays, and theoretical texts. He served as director of the National Library of Serbia from 2001 until January of 2012. Since January of 2012, he has been living in exile, first as a writer in residence at the Landis and Gear Foundation, ZUG, Culture Contact Vienna, and Literature House, Zurich. From 2013 to 2015, Ugricic was a visiting scholar at the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at Stanford University. And for the past four months, he has been a distinguished visiting scholar at the Kluge Center, working on his next book. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming excuse me, Sretan Ugricic. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everybody. First of all, let me thank Kluge Center team, librarian Dr. Billington, and John van Odenaren for inviting me here in Library of Congress to continue my research themed as Home Abroad. It's about artists who live and work estranged in their own homeland environment. Today, I would like to talk about integrity and credibility of art and literature, of artists and writers in oppressive, politically and morally deprived, deviant environments. In such environments, imminence of estrangement is obvious, not only for artists and intellectuals, but for any citizen. Close focusing on artists and writers is in such extreme environments should bring out the question how to articulate the distinction between 
self-censorship and inner emigration. Why such an issue is important? Because the difference is often intentionally hidden or masked, and because it looks like the difference between wrong and right. Namely, the difference between self-censorship and inner immigration should be the difference between compliance and defiance, between degradation and integrity, between cons consent and protest, between conformist and intransigent attitude, between coercion and conscience, between obedience and freedom. Of course, we should not forget that frontier between right and wrong may not appear strict and clear, especially in the realm of politics, not even after scrupulous investigations. My focus will be directed towards three artists. One of them, them is Gao Xingjian. The other is Karl Amadeus Hartmann, and third one is Rudolf Bauer. Three amazing persons with nine lives. You will see what I mean by this. I'm not going to define elementary notions such as art and censorship. Both categories are impossible to justify undeniably for different reasons, of course. Anyways, most of us are quite capable of, of intuitive recognition and differentiation on what is art and what's not, or what is censorship and what's not. To avoid misunderstanding, it's crucial to take into account the concrete context and usage of each notion. For example, is self-censored work of art still work of art? which bring us to the issue of integrity. In favor, I will just pre present two quotations by Hartmann himself, one of my heroes, and by Louis Buñuel. Sorry. These are those quotations. Carl Amadeus Hartmann said, art does not take orders. And Buñuel said, l'imagition est libre, el hombre no. Imagination is free, the man is not. This should very condensed way focus, uh, define what I mean by integrity of art. As for self-censorship, I define it simply as internalized censorship. Hence, as a form of censorship, self-censorship appears to be not good, morally and artistically compromised, versus inner immigration, which should be good under assumption that it defends integrity, autonomy, and credibility of art and of artists. Now let's switch to the investigation of inner immigration. Key words for inner immigration would be reticence, passivity, inwardness, double life, or in German terminology, Doppelleben, coded speech, writing between the lines, verdeckte schreibweise. Since the notion has been born in Germany, here are a few definitions by those artists who claim to practice it during Nazi period 1933-1945. The inner immigration concept first emerged in early 30s, immediately after Hitler seized the power not immediately after the defeat, as most of those who are familiar with the notion think. So let me quote some of these definitions by the artists themselves who uh, claim that they practiced inner emigration. Kurt Tucholsky, famous critic from Weimar period. I suppose I need not to tell you that our world in Germany has ceased to exist. So I'll, shut, so I'll shut up for a moment. No one holds a red card to an ocean. Ocean refers to tsunami of approaching fascism, of course. Imminence of estrangement is vivid in these words, together with the disturbing feeling of being abroad at home. Ernst Barlach and Johann Klepper both very quickly felt themselves condemned to the life of an emigrant inside the fatherland. 
As early as summer of 1933, Klepper spoke of his emigrant mood and explained that he found himself now entirely in exile, even physically still inside German territory. Barlach complained in 1937 that his condition was even more miserable than that of real emigrant. In famous 1946 polemic with exiled Thomas Mann, Frank Thies and Walter von Molo stated that inner emigration was more honorable than exile because it has been more difficult to live and work inside Third Reich, exposed directly to many pressures, violence, censorship, prosecution, intimidation, and other threats. This gave them basic to claim a greater moral and artistic credibility than the authors in exile who physically escaped the grievous pressure of life under Nazi regime. Forced into isolation, bound by the mission and morality of their art, they stand for the desperate attempt and individual resistance. Common to those more honest among them are self-doubt and questions about their own work, as expressed by Oskar Kokoschka in his diary from 1936. Can the sensitive artist put his head in the sand and stagger like a perfect idiot through a faithful present. Ernst Jinger, esoteric take, his esoteric take of inner emigration comes close to snobbism. He said, I searched out a higher standpoint from which I could observe how the bugs devour each other. Hitler personally ruled that Jinger was not to be bothered no doubt because of Jinger's participation as a journalist in the opposition during the Weimar period. Ernst Wickert, author of a novel called White Buffalo and the Great Justice, published 1937, the story is set in legendary India, considered as one of the boldest and most characteristic documents of what would count as coded or Aesopian manner of writing. Gottfried Bem, famous poet, acknowledged as mindless adherent and fellow traveler of Nazism for, quote, only one or two years, unquote. His conception of art and poetry was poetic form in and of itself as an act of resistance. He also declared, the, he, yes, is here. He also declared the army, Wehrmacht, is the aristocratic form of emigration. Johann Klepper, out of, author of the novel called Father, 1937, conservative Catholic, said, I remain with Romans 13, obedient to an authority even to which I am opposed. There is a spectrum of op options between active resistance and passive refusal between open action of direct resistance and mute silence of the passive refusal, there are many different possibilities for artists and for citizens. But it's clear that whatever simply remained silent and turned head away did not mount resistance of any kind. And whoever did not write or make art in manner servile to fascist ideology and state did not therefore write in an, in an anti-fascist way. Only recognizable posture of political distinction and moral opposition deserves the name inner emigration. And where there are such men, where are the, the such men and women, any of them? Whoever wanted to reach his contemporaries at that time had only two options, strictly speaking. Either to employ life risky illegal means inside or outside Germany, or to employ the language of some kind of, of subversive servitude. What if inner emigration was basically a connivance, a tacit consent of willingness to secretly allow wrongdoing or be involved directly or indirectly in wrongdoing? The problem with inner migration was that passivity and inwardness include compromises and, con uh, and concessions implied submissiveness and connivance. It is the problem of fatally endangered integrity. When, when, was, when was one permitted, 
faced with the pressures and threats from the evil barbaric regime of total control and limitless violence, to yield without discrediting oneself. When reticence slides into connivance and collusion, this is the key question here. Inner emigration is based on belief that while they made the minimum of unavoidable concessions, they also remained morally untouched, somehow. But few among more sincere practitioners of inner emigration acknowledge that inwardness or doppelleben or coded language is not enough. For example, in that state of mind lay already the guilt, the sin, the crime. Yes. <clears throat> Let's not forget that Nazis themselves had no doubt about it. Now I quote from uh, one report from uh, one party uh, officer. It goes like this. Still there are writers who ask what that means. The party, the movement, the state. I say to these senile remnants of yesterday, we can do wonderfully without you. We whistle and at the arrogance of so-called poets who believe that they, by the detour of inwardness and the phrases of eternal values, can get around the necessity of a clear, proper, unambiguous declaration of loyalty to national socialism and the fact of the Third Reich. So, inner immigration in Nazi Germany was participation and compliance, disguised in a form of non-participation and non-compliance. Contrary to that, Frank Thies, in his open letter to Thomas Mann, declared, the world of the inner German emigrants was an inner space at whose invasion and conquest, despite all his efforts, Hitler did not succeed. By sleight of hand, a virtue was made out of necessity, wherein one proclaimed that from the, that isolation had gained a treasure of insight and experience, and thus, correspondingly, much had been won for one intellectual and emotional development declared Thies, that one was now richer in knowledge and experience than the outer emigrants. But he would not want to blame anyone, he said. Thomas Mann, in the genesis of Dr. Faust, Faustus, concluded these polemics as following. A club called Inner Emigration established itself with much arrogance namely the community of intellectuals who stayed true to Germany, who did not live in, in the lurch, who did not watch its fate from the comfortable balcony seats of foreign countries, but rather shared the fate honestly. They would have shared it, remarked Thomas Mann in scornful conclusion, also if Hitler had won. From today's standpoint, it seemed incomprehensible that the German public would have supported these allegations against Thomas Mann. After all, Mann repeatedly called for understanding, compassion, and empathy while fighting against the heinous regime that the Germans claimed to have despised. And yet, the majority of German public found that these arguments spoke for their own feelings of failure, oppression, disappointment, and bitterness. Elizabeth Landgasser observed in 1947 that the fate of inner immigration was not inferior to that, however different, of outer immigration. Not a few emigrants, some of whom felt that they had to justify the direction, subscribed to that same sentiment. In year zero, 1945-46, one motivation for these and others later to uphold validity of inner migration was to support the idea of das andere Deutschland, the second Germany, another Germany, or the idea that there, that there had in fact been some form of opposition to Hitler. For as we know, there was little proof that any such resistance had had a substantive effect on the regime. 
Now, as we are more clear what inner immigration means, let's check a telling contemporary example. Story of three lives in life of Gao Xingyang contains all elements of our interest. Censorship, self-censorship, inner exile, exile. That's him. In year 2012, Mo Yan won a Nobel Prize for Literature. China celebrated him as the first Chinese writer to achieve the award. But Mo Yan was not the first. It was Gao Xingyan in 2000, author of novels including Soul Mountain and One Man's Bible. Gao Xiang was awarded the Nobel Prize for an oeuvre of universal validity, but bitter insights, and linguistic ingenuity. The Chinese Foreign Ministry and Chinese Writers Association both criticized the award given to Gao Xiang and as politically motivated. The Chinese Writers Association said, China has several outstanding literary authors. The Nobel Prize jury seems to be ignorant of this. In 1987, Zhao Xingyang was able to travel to France as a painter, because he is not only a writer, he is a painter as well, and began what he described as his second life. He has not returned to China since, sought political asylum, and was granted French citizenship in 1998. After I went to France, I finally had an environment where I could work freely, he said. So you could say I worked extremely hard, but I was now very happy. Since his Nobel win was ignored by China, where his works have been banned for years, Gao Xingjiang now ignores China. He is overheavenly immersed in his work. I haven't had a holiday in 26 years, he said in this 2014 interview for, for BBC. I will play a little excerpt from this uh, video in a moment for you. I'm always working. Gao says he has little interest in China despite spending close to 50 years there. There are a lot of changes going on in China, but I don't understand them and I'm not interested, declares Gao. He admits that he has not read any works by Mo Yan, the second Chinese language author to win Nobel Prize for Literature, who Chinese authorities still loud as the first Chinese writer to win the prize. Now, let's hear Gao himself. My first life was in China, but I left China in the end. I wanted to write freely, but I encountered all sorts of obstacles and problems. There was a lot of political interference. During the Cultural Revolution, they burned and banned books and persecuted intellectuals. I had to write in secret, and when I burned my works to avoid trouble, I had to burn them in secret too. The terror of the Cultural Revolution was not a white terror, but a red terror. Let's take into consideration Gao's inner emigration during Mao's Cultural Revolution. Hiding, burying uh, or burning of manuscripts by the author himself was conduct of self-censorship because he in internalized inevitable censorship. He was afraid of repercussions. So Gao was censored and self-censored. Here we can discern the less obvious but morally relevant distinction between censorship and self-censorship. What is this distinction? To be censored, author must display stalwart courage and integrity despite repercussions. But in order to display self-censorship, author complies with external threat and displays compromise collusion and fear. We condone self-censorship. Our moral understanding and empathy goes for self-censored artists and self-censored works of art. 
but our moral, moral admiration and respect goes to, to censored artists and censored work of art. Gao's Nobel win and sub subsequent renown and eminence was a long way off from his early life in China, where he feared for his safety during the Cultural Revolution and was forced to burn his writings in secret to avoid persecution. He said, my first life was in China and I left China in the end. Gao le felt the need to burn all of his early works to avoid being denounced. Nonetheless, after being relocated to the countryside for re-education, he continued to write in secret, burying his writings underground. I could only write in secret, like as he, as he said, and when it came to burning, burning, uh, burning, I had to burn them in secret too. He continued to face censorship in China after the Cultural Revolution ended, with plays including Bus Stop and the other shore, which were banned. In 1987, he was able to travel to France as a painter and began what he de described as second life. He achieved a political asylum and uh, uh, citizenship, and thus his third life began in October 2000, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. So now let's keep open. This was the story about Lao, uh, Gao Xinjiang. For now, let's keep open the question if Gao's acts of secret writing and destroying and hiding manuscripts during the Cultural Revolution had been an example of inner emigration or of self censorship. And don't forget, it is the question of right and wrong. Imminence of estrangement in circumstances during Mao's Cultural Revolution is obvious, or in Stalin era of purge, or in Nazi Germany. But how about liability of inner emigration? To put more focus on this, I will just present three quotations. Okay, I will re read it to you. First quotation is by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He said, one cannot live in society and be, be free from society. Second quotation is by Theodor Adorno. He said, wrong life cannot be lived rightly. And third quotation is by Bertolt Brecht, he said, what a terrible times to, do we live in when a conversation about trees almost constitutes a crime because it equals a silence about so many atrocities. So as you see from these quotations, concept of inner emigration is suffused with a troubling ethical ambiguity. And if one could be present at the scene of crime and yet, how it can be morally absent from it? Was it possible to live quietly and inwardly through the Third Reich without being partly implicated in what occurred there? So how inner emigration is possible at all? Is there any real example to prove it? The closest example I could find so far from uh, this uh, context of Nazi Germany is the example and the story of Karl Amadeus Hartmann. He also, in a way, lived in one life, three lives. First, his life was during, uh, before fascism. Second life of his was during fascism. And the third life of his was after fascism. He's from Munich. Let me show you his picture. This him. He's from Munich. He wasn't Jewish, even the last name sounds Jewish. 
He was German, Roman Catholic by confession, social democrat, democrat as a political option. He voluntarily withdrew from musical life during the Nazi era while remaining in Germany. He was master German symphonist whose work drew deeply from almost three centuries of Austro-German tradition and modernism, from Bach to Weber, and distilled these influences in his own style, which spoke with abundant power and emotional urgency. Hartmann was not motivated by religious faith, nor was he driven by political creed or moral code. His only principle was art does not take orders. Half prisoned himself uh, half poisoned himself to avoid military conscription, Hartmann went to study with out, outlawed serial Anton von Webern in Vienna, who introduced mathematical rigor to his technique. Married to a daughter of a ball bearings manufacturer who grew wealthier in the war, he wrote symphonic movements and showed them, in the, uh, showed them in the drawer and buried them in the woods. So again, burying uh, art in the woods or in the earth. Unlike the rest of Munich, which pretended that Dachau did not exist at the end of the suburban train line, he held the concentration camp in mind first and last in his wartime works. He was a great believer in the moral possibilities of art precisely at the time that it was being so profoundly debased. Hartmann chose to stay in Germany, but was one of the disturbingly few composers who did not collaborate with Nazis. He withdrew from public musical life and channeled his opposition into his music, which he continued to compose, but refused to perform or publish. He became the epitome of artistic autonomy, integrity, and credibility. As the war intensified, Hartmann buried his manuscripts deep in the mountains for safekeeping, but he survived the war through his wife's family wealth and through delicate dance with authorities. As a member of the family well integrated and connected with the regime, he was invited to perform and publish his works. Nazis were aware of his left political inclinations and the modernist aesthetics, but they were willing to include him in a public, as a public figure of renown, indirectly gaining justification and on domestic public scene as well as on international scene. But Hartmann didn't comply. Hartmann was the textbook inner emigrant example, one who remained in the country physically but spiritually withdraw from the, his surroundings. His experiences of suffering under the Nazis while retaining ethical integrity have all the makings of the perfect musical and moral, moral resistance. This is the story which should prove that inner immigration is a real concept. But when I studied the case of Carla Amadeus Hartmann, another version of his story came out. And now I will tell you in detail this a second version of his three lives. It goes like this. But okay, but before this, let me just play 30 seconds of his music just to be more familiar with him. Thank you. 
okay. His brother Richard was a card-carrying communist, distributing anti-Nazi leaflets around Munich upon Hitler's coming to power, and hence he quickly had to flee the, to Switzerland. The other brother, Adolf, painter, was close to the famous expressionist blau writer group. Karl was social democrat in politics and modernist in music. At the beginning of his career, his music has been touched by jazz, atonal experiments, Slavic and Jewish melodies, futurism, dada, and other currents in the carefree manner, in a number of comp compositions, as he later recalled. Hartmann's creativity as a composer, writes his biographer Andrew McCready, from the beginning was characterized by its purpose to destroy the barriers erected by race, religion, and social status. Hence, he was already programmed for a collision with the National Socialist regime even before January 1933. After that moment, he said, it was necessary to give testimony not out of despair and fear of the regime, but as a countermeasure. So he avoided going public with his music inside the Third Reich and instead sought exposure abroad. And there he associated himself in various manners with known anti-fascists and their internationally staged events. In 1935, for example, his composition Misere was performed in Prague, which of that time was filled with anti-Hitler emigrants, and in 1938 in Brussels. Words of dedication for that composition, I quote, the work was dedicated to my friends who had to die in the hundreds and who are sleeping in eternity. We shall not forget you. It was dated Dachau, 1933. With the beginning of the war in September 1939, Hartmann's already hopeless life in Munich became even more difficult. A period of inertia followed, caused, uh, followed, caused by extreme desperation and fear. He depended almost exclusively on the generosity of his father-in-law, the wealthy manager of the Bavarian ball bearings factory. Father-in-law provided them with a flat in the city and with summer villa at the lake. The entire arrangement was painful to Hartmann. He had to swallow his pride in accepting money and accommodation and all manner of aid from another man who was so close to highest Nazi ranks and who initially had even been against him as a son-in-law. Additionally, even with this assistance and having no earning, uh, earnings of his own, money for basic survival was never enough. Hence, Hartmann was continually pursuing for opportunities to earn abroad, either through the publication of his music or by way of praise, praises international juries might award him. These prizes almost always eluded him, and in Germany he felt loneliness and lack of recognition. And in early 1937, Hartmann has a nervous breakdown. Hartmann became paranoid in, ex in expectation of the worst for his manuscripts. In December of 1942, he inquired Viennese publisher Universal Edition whether the seven autographs of scores, which he, he had entrusted to the firm without retaining copies in Munich, were at risk in Vienna because of bombings. As for the rest of his total output, according to composer's statement after the war, in order to work, work to be safe, at the height of the conflict, he had buried all the scores in a zinc container two meters deep in the mountains. So again, burying art in the soil. Imagine this act of hiding entire over buried in woods. Was it act of inner resistance and inner emigration, or was it just paranoia, or both? Was it act of moral strength or act of psychological weakness, even exhibitionism, or both? At any rate, after breakdown, he did not compose again until late 1944, 
After learning that Gestapo had arrested a dissident sympathizer, his friend, chemist Robert Havenan. Symphony named Klagesang was dedicated to Havemann and performed first time in 1946. Hartmann's last wartime composition was the second piano sonata, a piece once more dedicated to the victims of Nazi terror system. It was inscribed, endless was the queue, endless was the misery, endless was the suffering. Hartmann had conceived it after watching 20,000 Dachau camp inmates shuffle by the house of his in-laws on Lake Stanberg on their death march at the end of April 1945, just before Americans liberated the camp. As someone who practiced inner resistance and inner emigration, how did Hartmann function in the view of the authorities? In fall of 1933, Hartmann, by default, had become a member of the composer's sections of the music chamber, pending the observance of minimum requirement for the most, namely his providing proof of full so-called Aryan li uh, lineage for himself and his wife. But despite repeated calls to do so since 1935, he never answered the query and he should, as he should have. Finally, notice RMK came in 1936, threatening the implementation of paragraph 10 of the law, meaning to exclude all unreliable musicians who were Jews or Marxist. Anyways, final repercussion failed. He, he, he remained very quiet, not active at the German music scene at all, so formally remained a member of RMK, beneficiary of gray zones of Nazi cultural policy only with the note attached stating, I quote, he still has not supplied full proof of his racial pedigree, neither for himself or for, or for his wife, unquote. Although from then on, Hartmann showed himself concerned in letters to his friends, warning sometimes in veiled language that regarding foreign trips abroad, he would have to proceed with caution, he still felt safe enough to undertake such trips without even bothering to declare them officially to RMK. Instead, he traveled as a private citizen on the strength of his personal passport. As for the Dachau dedication, that traitorous inscription was visible on the original score only for conductor, on the podium in Prague and in Brussels. So RMK never learned of it. Otherwise, Hartmann would have committed virtual suicide had he made this text more public. Party assessment of Hartmann's political reliability from late 1941 states as follows. He wishes to be received into the party and as member of NSV, the National People's Charity, he contributes well, if judged according to his poor income. His son Richard has not yet joined the Hitler Jugend because of his youth. The, surpri the surprisingly favorable summary, however, read further as follows. Some years ago, the person in question was not yet nationally minded, but he is so now. He always salutes with Hitler greeting. As has been ascertained, his reading consists of national socialist literature. The cell reader responsible for his re residence knows him by his ever generous handouts." Unquote. Hartmann himself said that he survived the war only through much cunning and shrewdness. Many anti-Nazi Germans were known to have behaved in the same way, especially during the war. So how to recognize who is who? An anti-Nazi who during the regime pretended to be Nazi or pro-Nazi now may look the same to us as a real Nazi who during the regime pretended to be not Nazi or anti-Nazi under the mask of inner emigration. In the years following Germany's surrender, Hartmann became very important and influential figure in mat materially and morally devastating environment of West Germany. 
trying hard to reignite music life on basic of aesthetics and cultural policy opposite to Nazi's aesthetics. Hartmann was employed by American military occupation forces to promote cultural re-education and to combat Bavarian regionalism and German nationalism. Then, in 1946, an open invitation reached him to leave the West for the sake of big career in the East. Again, it came in 1950, easily accepting the communist, in 1950, easily accepting the communist image of DDR as an anti-fascist state, Hartmann inclined towards left, have been almost ready to go until, until he Reconsider the discriminatory treatment of Schenberg and of the Second Viennese School as a reprehensible formalist according to the rigid interpretation by communist regime in East Germany. To discredit, Hartmann made his final decision in favor of creative freedom and democracy and stayed in Munich. He continued to base his activities in Munich for the remainder of his life his administrative duties absorbed much of his time and energy. So this is another story, another version of the story of the three lives of Karl Amadeus Hartmann. The closest case of uh, inner emigration as I could find in my research. Like Gao Xingjian, Hartmann also lived three lives. But those were different in, uh, uh, in diverging narratives on these three lives. We saw the two different stories. Now my final story of three lives in one is about German painter Rudolf Bauer. Besides Vasily Kandinsky, he was and he is still the biggest name of abstract or so-called non-objective painting. This is Rudolf Bauer in his studio in United States. And here are some of his paintings. Okay. Bauer's place in art history is linked to the lives of two people, Solomon Guggenheim and Hila Rebai the Guggenheim Museum founding director. You can see them here with a uh, famous architect, uh, Frank Roy Lloyd Wright, who designed now famous museum, Guggenheim Museum. So, she, uh, Hila Rebay, Baroness, in, was introduced Bauer's work to Guggenheim. The charismatic Baroness was an eccentric and passionate woman who simultaneously was Solomon Guggenheim's mistress and Rudolf Bauer's lover. Yet Rebai's conviction, co coupled with Guggenheim's financial resources, introduced non-objective art to American public. Rebai was instrumental in establishing not only the Guggenheim collection, but also the iconic building designed to house it, as she was the one to arrange for Frank Lloyd Wright to design this new temple of art on Fifth Avenue. Bauer's fame started in Berlin Gallery Der Sturm. He was initiated into Der Sturm circle around 1915, with his participation in a number of group exhibitions together with Kandinsky, Frank Mark, Paul Klee, Mark Chagall, members of the Brücke and the Blaue Reuter, various French cubists and the Italian futurist. Bauer's early relationship with Rebai was affectionate but difficult. One of the factors straining the relationship was that Rebai's parents did not find Bauer to be suitable match for their daughter. In 1926, Rebai wrote in a letter, he's my boy. He was too poor to marry me. In 1927, Ribai sailed to the United States. She established there herself quickly as an avant-garde and outspoken New York artist. 
Through her connections, she met Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney and Irene Guggenheim, who was Mrs. Solomon Guggenheim. Eventually, Ribai became friendly with Guggenheims, and Solomon, charmed by her, asked her to paint his portrait. Solomon Guggenheim probably first encountered not non-objective art in Rebai's studio in Carnegie Hall, which she had set up in an informal gallery, as an informal gallery. Rebai wrote to Bauer that Guggenheim has fallen in love with one of Bauer's watercolors and wanted to buy it. Intrigued by and, by and infatuated with her, Guggenheim hired Ribai as his personal curator. Before Ribai entered his life, Guggenheim had collected only old masters. Once inside his inner circle, the Baroness did not waste any time telling the copper magnate that a man of his vision and means should seek out contemporary art and help living artists. Instead of the art of yesterday, she said, he should collect the art of tomorrow. Over the next several years, Ribai helped Guggenheim amass what would become one of the world's greatest collection of modern art. Guggenheim collected predominantly works of by Bauer and Kandinsky, many of them acquired directly through Bauer in Germany. In September 1930, flushed with money from sales of his work to Guggenheim, Bauer decided that, uh, the time was right to establish a new art salon in Berlin, named as Geistreich, the Reich of the Spirit, not the Third Reich, but the Geistreich. Bauer conceived it as a temple of non-objectivity, as he called it, a sanctuary that, where Guggenheim and other well-heeled buyers would congregate to choose works for their collections. The influx of money from Guggenheim went a long way for Bauer in the depressed Berlin economy. After all his struggles, Bauer embarked on the lifestyle to which he had never been accustomed with chauffeur and servants. Few people in Germany were buying art at that time, which made Bauer especially reliant on collectors from other, um, from other countries. What Bauer could not anticipate was that as the de decade faded, collectors, including Guggenheim, were less and less inclined to visit Germany because of the deteriorating political situation. In contrast with Berlin, the art scene in New York in the mid-30s was bustling. In this fertile atmosphere, inspired by Bauer's Das, das Geistreich, Ribai lobby, uh, uh, lobbied Guggenheim to consider founding his new his own new museum. So in 1936, Guggenheim's collection became the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation with Ribai as its director. She began to organize exhibitions of the Solomon Guggenheim collection of non-objective paintings. The collection had its public debut 1936 in Charleston, South Carolina, where Solomon spent his winter months followed by the exhibitions in Philadelphia, Chicago, and Baltimore. In 1936, Bauer traveled to the United States to attend the opening of the Guggenheim exhibition in Charleston. Since, his, since he spoke no English, Ribai served as his interpreter. This was Bauer's first visit to the United States and the first time he saw his work installed so prominently outside Germany. The trip fell, left a favorable impression on Bauer and led him to believe that his dream of a permanent museum for his work was possible through Guggenheim. Back in Berlin, das Geistreich had become a lonely island of individualism in a menacing sea of Nazism. The Bauhaus had been closed down by the government in 1933, and artists such as Bauer were increasingly ostracized. Many had already fled the country. Ribai wrote Bauer in August 37 to report that she had visited the degenerate art exhibition in Munich, infamous uh, exhibition, which featured many artists from the, their, their Sturm days, including works of Kandinsky, Klee, Mohol Linaj, and of course Bauer. The intent of the exhibition was to display artwork that Nazi government had deemed to be corrupt, 
decadent Bolshevik and un-German. Among artists, however, it was likely an avant-garde badge of honor to be included in such exhibition. Ironically, the works in the degenerate art show were made available for sale. Ribai wisely, uh, Baroness Ribai wisely arranged to purchase the best pieces for Guggenheim collection. Why Bauer lingered so long in this hostile environment remains a mystery to me. He was not Jewish, yet his patron was one of the richest Jews in the world. This association would not go unnoticed in Nazi Germany. In July 1937, Bauer traveled to Paris because his work was included in an exhibition organized by Museum du Jeu de Pont. In this large survey of the period, his painting was shown alongside the works of Picasso, Braque, Leger, Chagall, and Juan Miró. It is believed that while he was in Paris, he received word from France that it was too dangerous to return to, return to Berlin, yet he ignored the warning. Soon after his return, he was arrested for being a degenerate, degenerate, degenerate artist and for speculating on the black market with American dollars because he had a lot of dollars from Guggenheim. And he was insanely rich at that moment. It is likely that, according to German standards, it is likely that his sister, a Nazi zealot who had disowned him, turned him into the authorities for his art. In letter to him, his sister stated, I think I have excerpt from the letter. It says like this, I'm totally convinced that you are completely and entirely under the influence of Jews and Freemasons. You called our dear Dr. Gables a little crippled chap. It seems that you prefer all the money that the filthy Jews pigs are paying you for your paint blood seeds and the money a German worker would pay for a decent picture. This is Ellie writing you, your former sister, as under the circumstances, I am no longer one. Bauer, who had been living like a prince for the past decade, was suddenly a prisoner in Berlin. Defiant, he scavenged scraps of paper and pencils while in prison so that he could continue to draw. Here are some examples of these very little drawings. I like them very much from the prison. He would secretly make them and then hide it, them in, a, in some uh, wall or below the uh, bed or something like this. There are many prison drawings that remain, studies for future canvases that he must have hoped to paint once released from jail. Disturbed by the news that Bauer had been imprisoned, Baroness Ribai implored Guggenheim to help free him. The Baroness traveled to Germany with a suitcase filled with cash to rescue the king of non-objective art. To help broker a deal with the Gestapo, Ribai asked her brother, General Franz Hugo von Ribai, to meet with Bauer's captors, and he agreed. After what seems to be hours of unsuccessful debate, General revealed the suitcase, which would help secure Bauer's freedom. Two months later, Bauer was still not free, and the General Franz Hugo von Rebay had to do a return visit to the prison. This time, a new Gestapo official was more sympathetic to Bauer's case and money, and released him unconditionally a few days later. Unwelcome and unsafe at home, Bauer ultimately made the choice to emigrate to the United States and set sail for New York a year later in August 1939. Two months before Rudolf Bauer arrived in the United States from Germany, the Museum of Non-Objective Painting showcasing the Guggenheim Collection opened in New York City. The exhibition titled Art of Tomorrow was dominated by 215 works by Bowers and 103 works by Kandinsky. Bauer arrived in America in August 1939 to a hero's welcome. The newly freed artist stayed with Ribai 
at her home in Connecticut during his first four months in the US, after which time he suggested, probably to Ribeye's dismay, that he would like a home of his own. In order to make his wish a reality, it was necessary for Bauer to settle his accounts with Solomon Guggenheim and the foundation. Guggenheim conveyed to Ribeye and Bauer the financial support he, will, he was willing to provide. In a letter, Bauer outlined some concerns he had regarding the purchase of his work by Guggenheim Foundation. Perhaps the most critical point in, uh, that the artist made in his letter concerns the word output, which Bauer was one unable to find in his dictionary, but the, the, but the translation of which sounds bad to him somehow. The implication of this wording, which Bauer sensed but did not fully grasp, was, the Guggenheim, was that Guggenheim was planning to lay claim to the artist's future work as well. So everything from that moment on should belong to Guggenheim, what uh, um, uh, Bauer produced. A few weeks later, Bauer signed the contract. Not speaking the language and perhaps not wanting to insult his generous patron, Bauer signed the document even though it had not been translated into German. Money arrived and he purchased the mansion in the deal on seaside. This is this beautiful picture, I think, from the here. And began a new life in America, complete with an attractive Austrian-born maid named Louise Huber, hired for him by the foundation. Shortly thereafter, Bauer began translating the contract himself. He discovered that instead of lump sum payment of $300,000, which he had expected, the contract provided him with only 15,000 a year in interest on bonds that Guggenheim had placed in trust for him. While this was a lot of money in 1939, it is decidedly not what the artist had expected. While one might speculate that Guggenheim and Ribay considered this trust fund approach a good idea, the fact that Bauer has signed away his life work for 15,000 a year, a house, a car, and a car, and a maid, was too much for Bauer to bear. So began a frustrating and fruitless stage of Bauer's life. Crushed by what he perceived to be a terrible betrayal, he lost his will to paint. He will not paint ever again, up to the very end of his life. At the age of 50, at the height of his artistic powers, instead of focusing on painting, Bauer became a man obsessed with protecting his creative legacy. He disputed the contract, but details of the dispute and settlement were not clear. For more than a decade, Bauer had been Guggenheim's favorite artist and had played a prominent role as advisor to both Ribay and Guggenheim on what to collect. In spite of these plans, as his relationship with Ribay began to deteriorate, it became clear that Bauer was to have no say in the running of the foundation that now controlled his art. The intrigue between Bauer and Ribai, triggered by Bauer's contract with Guggenheim and Ribai's unwillingness to share administration of the foundation with him, reached Shakespearean proportions around 1942. Bauer intimidated to the FBI that Ribai was a Nazi spy. Ribai was investigated by the FBI and ultimately placed under arrest for harding coffee and sugar in her garage, the only crime that could unearth. Four days after Ribai was arrested, Bauer tried to start a putsch to remove the Baroness from the position at the Guggenheim Foundation. This declaration of war was backed by members of the foundation staff, many of whom were struggling artists too fearful previously to speak up against Ribai for fear of losing their job. Lonely and isolated, Bauer found a sympathetic and willing companion in Louis Huber, his maid, and a relationship ensued. They married in 1944. 
This relationship provoked sketching letters and comments from Hila, Rebai, Baroness, who referred to Louise in writing as a streetwalker and a whore. On behalf of Huber, Bauer sued Rebai for slander for the sum of $250,000. When Ribai won the suit in 1945, primarily through the eloquence and connections of her attorney, 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 Bauer lost the struggle for the power. When Guggenheim died in 1949, the collection that Ribai and Bauer helped shape for over 20 years and the legacy that Guggenheim had sought to establish through its exhibition was at the mercy of the foundation's trustees. Rudolf Bauer died in November 1953, spared the humiliation of witnessing the total suppression of his work from the collections, for the collection he had helped to define. This melodramatic story demonstrates vividly how American capitalism was more oppressive and damaging to the talented and powerful artist than horrors of Nazi prison. In the Nazi prison, Bauer continued to work, but once exiled among American elite, he moved back into artistic passivity and inwardness of inner emigration in USA. Now let me just briefly make my conclusion out of these three stories of nine lives, because of all, in all three stories there were three lives in one. As Michael Philip suggested in his social history of the inner emigration phenomenon in Germany, the concept remains highly elusive. Distinctions between collaboration and so-called aesthetic resistance are often permeated by a politically charged post-war ideology. Broadly speaking, the whole ideological, political, moral, and artistic middle range between a totalitarian order of terror and active opposition or open re resistance should be declared inner emigration. But if we take the example of Nazism, this idea tends towards conclusion of artistic collective guilt, which is dubious. What if the quandary is a fake one? Because yes, there is real middle field, and because no, it's not inner emigration. It is self-censorship. Inner emigration is, in fact, a very rare phenomenon, a precedent never to become the rule, simply because its preconditions are socially and psychologically so rare, which is totally opposite from self-censorship, social and psychological preconditions of which are ubiquitous and everlasting across all time and space coordinates. Namely, inner emigration is possible only if an artist doesn't suffer under pressure or threat of losing status, income, freedom, or life. And nevertheless, he or she rejects to participate. If persuasive means is real, then anything except direct confrontation will be self-censorship as a form of self-defense. And we should be cautious about this self-defense. Let us not forget that it is self-defense of artists, not of his or her work of art. Which se with self-censorship, artist gives away integrity of work in order to defend him or herself. Since context and use of the term define its meaning, in contexts such as Nazism or Stalinism, passivity and inwardness mean passive acceptance and indirect justification. But in a context where, where and when fascism or Stalinism are defeated and gone, former passivity and inwardness suddenly, with hindsight, gain the meaning of passive resistance refusal and contestation. Myth of inner emigration looks very convenient, isn't it? The, key, the key, key question for us was, when is one permitted, faced with the pressures and threats from the evil regimes of total control, to yield without discrediting oneself? 
when reticence slides irretrievably into connivance and collusion. This was our key question. Where is that red line? And now we may answer, there is no red line there. There is no inner emigration. In totalitarian surroundings, inner emigration is just, is just legend, fiction, myth, mask failure of dignity and integrity. Inner emigration, like any ideology, is based on following elements. Let me see. So, so as any ideology, inner immigration is based on blind spot of partiality, irresistible illusion of impunity, and habit forming drug of complacency. Instead, there is only self-censorship. This is only real. But with self-censorship, integrity of work of art is inevitably impaired, badly damaged. So in, extreme, so in extreme circumstances, such as Germany from 1933-45, USSR from 1924-53, uh, or China during Cultural Revolution, or today's North Korea, Personal and artistic integrity requires physical flee or exile, or direct public resistance, or suicide. Only these three options are moral beyond any doubt. Other options are also human, of course, but conscience damaging. As Adorno unforgettably put it, wrong life cannot be lived rightly. Individual must act to protect and serve conscience at whatever cost. With this note, I would thank you for your attention. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.